kind of, I gave you some hints last uh, week, and uh, not on purpose. Actually, I didn't really think about it till after I had taught the, the lesson. I went back and was like, oh, I already kind of gave away this week. But we're going to, we've just been looking at uh, what did Mary know last time, and then we looked at the Christmas story the week before that. And I, I want to just uh, look at the, there's something that happens back here in the Old Testament that uh, it begins to generate and it begins to um, uh, promote something where the Scripture foresee, foreseeing that Christ was going to be born of the Virgin Mary, there's something that happened back here in the Old Testament that's going to, that is, it's not really well known. It's just one of those little things. You got Genesis 3? Go get Mark 6. I'll show you something just in, in, along this lines to illustrate this. Get Mark 6 and get Psalm 69. And you can hang on to Genesis 3 there for a minute. Get Psalm 69 and Mark 6. And when you talk about Mary, and, and there are little verses that are hid, and they're really not hid because they're right there on the pages, but you got to be paying attention to what you're reading and studying, and you go, oh, yeah, okay. And Mark chapter number 6, all of the new Bibles in, in Matthew 1 where he says that Jesus was her firstborn son, they pull out firstborn because firstborn would indicate what? There were more kids that she was going to have, and he was her first. And, and the Catholic Church, they do that in their Scripture. All the new Bibles are, are, are manufactured off of that, that text. And so they hide it. So look at Mark 6 and verse number 3. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary? So obviously we're talking about the Lord, aren't we? Mm -hmm. The brother of James and Joseph and, and of Judah and the Simeon, of Simon. You see, he's got four brothers. And are not his sisters here with us? Now, sisters is plural, so that's at least two. So Mary had seven children, counting the Lord, okay? But what the new Bibles do is they don't, they don't say brother or sister. They change that word to cousin, and they make them cousins. Now, okay, that's fine, but go back to chapter 69 of Psalms, and notice a verse that they haven't quite found yet. Because in Psalm 69, there's a verse tucked away here, and this is, I'm just trying to use this as an illustration of what we're going to talk about this morning as we look at who saved Christmas. Look, if you will, at uh, verse number 8. We'll just jump right in there. Psalm 69, 8. I am become a stranger. Now, by the way, Psalm 69 is the reproach psalm. It's talking about the Lord. It's a messianic psalm. He says in verse 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's what? <clears throat> children. They don't change that one in the New Bibles. They, they miss that verse. Isn't that interesting? Okay. What'd she say? Exactly. Most people don't read the Old Testament. See that? But you see how the Word does that. So when we look this morning at who saved Christmas, we're going to get some background information. Go back to Genesis 3 now. And it's going to kind of peel off of what we were talking about last week about Mary and what Mary knew, and, and so forth. And, and then as we work down through this, there's just going to be some hidden information. And again, it's not hidden. It's right here on the Scripture page. You just have to do what? Read it, study it, come to understand what's talking about. In Genesis chapter number 3, in verse number 15, now Genesis 3, you have the fall of Adam and Eve the fall of man. Wherefore, by one man sin entered into the world, so death passed upon all men. And this is where this happens, and, and Satan comes up and, 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 and beguiles and, and bewitches Eve, and gets Eve to change the book and to go, gets Eve to quit looking at who she was in Christ, and looking at something else. And he, he takes her away from the simplicity of that's in Christ. So God walks in and says, Adam, where are you? And Adam and Eve, are, they're, they're, they, they do Operation Fig Leaf, as Dad calls it, and they produce the first religious activity of covering themselves up. And that's what religion does. Try to cover yourself up, make you look better than what you really are. And he says, hey, I, I'm looking for you. Where are you? Well, he finally, Adam and Eve, speak up. And, 
and God begins to curse Adam and Eve, but he curses the, the serpent as well. Now, the serpent is obviously Satan, and we'll see that here in, in, in verse 15, but when he talks, calls Satan the serpent, he's not talking about a snake wrapped around a tree, as you see in the pictures. He's talking about the character. That, that is a metaphor that describes the character of the individual he's talking to. And he was a serpent. He's a beguiler. He's an imitator. In verse number 15, verse 14, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So there's a promise made here of the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman here is, is, the, is now going to be the issue. In the first promise made by God to man is right here, and it's the seed of the woman. And what is the seed going to do to to the serpent seed? Well, he's going to bruise his head, and he's going to bruise your heel. Now, if you bruise a serpent's head, what did you do to the serpent? You killed it, didn't you? But yet he still bites, doesn't he? And you and he get the so the Lord. So we're, what are we talking about? We're talking about Calvary. We're moving out towards Calvary. And when you think about Calvary, what begins to happen in Calvary is in those three hours of darkness, you see this promise coming, being fulfilled. Where Satan literally loses everything in those hours of darkness and the battle on the cross. So that as Hebrews said, he came to defeat him that held the keys of death and hell. Now in Revelation, when the Lord is described, he holds the keys to death and hell. Well, how did he get the keys away from the serpent? He beat him. He, he, he killed him. He, he triumphs openly in it, Paul says in Colossians. That happens right here. But there's the seed of the woman. Now, think about the seed of the woman. Run over to Isaiah chapter 7. By the way, we're going to be in the Old Testament for a little bit here this morning, okay? <clears throat> I know we're, we're a grace church, and I know we study Paul, but we study all of the book. And uh, we just don't plant, and we got to get it all because it's all important. It all links together, and it all creates this wonderful picture of God's plan. Isaiah 7. So in Scripture, the seed, it, the seed of the woman here is going to be the issue. But in Scripture, the seed moves to the male, to the male side. We're going to see at Abraham. Then we see what? Isaac and Jacob, don't we? We'll see this in just a minute. Then we see Israel. Then we see the tribe of Judah. Then we see Bo, uh, Jesse's family and David, right? And it's all through the males, isn't it? It's, a, it's amazing. By the way, the new Bibles, they try to kill the seed line. And they hide it and they obscure it. Look at 714 of Isaiah. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. What's the sign? The virgin is going to have a son, and what are we going to call his name? Emmanuel. That's Matthew chapter 1. You begin to see that, don't you? Matthew 1 there in verse number um, 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. John 1 verse 14 says, And the flesh was the word was made flesh and dwelt among men. There was the first sign that something special was going on when Mary, when the birth and when when the Lord is born there. Now go back to Genesis, because we talk about the seed of the woman issue for just a minute. There's a supernatural thing going on there when, when Gabriel talks. Come over to Genesis 12. So the seed of the woman runs, and obviously man is corrupt. God kills off man through the flood, saving Noah and his, three, and his family, the three boys. But the seed line stays there, and the seed line is going to begin to work through Noah and, and his three boys. By the way, do you know who, which boy? 
Do you know which boy? Seth. No, Noah's, Noah's. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Do you remember? Japheth. Japheth is the one that it continues to run through. Or is it Shem? I don't know. It's Shem. I'm sorry. Yeah, oops. Yeah, the day cool hasn't kicked in yet. <laughs> okay? The... Anyway, Genesis chapter 12. You have the seed of the woman become the seed of Abraham. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Boy, what a promise given to Abraham, and, to, and, and given to Abraham and, and to his seed line. The problem is, is Abraham has uh, a, an issue. He's an old man. Come over to chapter 13. And in that old man issue, and Sarah's old, older, she, she's barren as well. And so how in the world do we have a seed? How do we have children? Abraham and Sarah didn't have children. So the Lord pops up, chapter 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated af- uh, from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for how long? Forever. This issue will never end. doesn't matter what the politics of the day look like. Who's getting that land over there in the Palestine in the Middle East? Abraham and his seed is, ultimately. They can dicker about it. They can you in it all to death. They can do this. They can do that. It ain't going to make a hill of beans in the end. Who's getting that land? Abraham and his seed is. But you notice how the seed of the woman moved to Abraham and Abraham's seed. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto Abram, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bow shall, thou, shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it for him, counted it to him for righteousness. There, what is Abraham learning? Abraham's learning that what's God going to do with Abraham and Sarah? He's going to do a supernatural event here and cause Sarah to have a seed. Young man named Isaac. Now, this is not the virgin birth, because Abraham's involved in the picture, okay? But it is a supernatural event, because Abraham and Sarah are, are, that's why Abram believed the Lord, and it was counted to him for righteousness, because his faith, by grace through faith, and faith alone, his faith in the Word of God was, he knew that him and Sarah, in their own activity, in their own flesh, by the way, this is Romans 4, couldn't get the job done. Now, he's going to try and help, and he has, Ish, uh, he, he has Ishmael. Come over to chapter 49. Chapter 49, just for time, because we got you all would like to go home today. Okay? <clears throat> if you don't, I would. <laughs> I, Genesis 49. So, Isaac is had. Isaac has two boys, Esau and Jacob. The elder shall serve the younger. And Jacob is the, the one. Genesis 49, verse 1. Jacob has 12 boys. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Jacob's going to talk to his boys here now, and it's going to be a prophecy about the last days, about the end of the uh, uh, down the road, future. By the way, Jacob also had many daughters. He didn't just have boys, he had daughters. 
But the boys are the ones where? Where the birthright's running and the seed's running through. Verse 9. Judah is a lion's... By the way, each boy, Jacob is going to give a prophetic picture about what's going to happen to that boy's tribe, that lineage. Okay? So to Judah, verse 9, is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as an old lion who shall rouse him up. Notice that Judah is described as a what? As a lion. Interesting. What's going to be about the Lord? He's going to be a lion. Lion of Judah. What is Satan called? He's a roaring lion seeking to devour whom he can. See, the, where that stuff comes from isn't somebody just made it up. It's coming out of a prophecy here, right, from the word of, from, from God's mouth to Jacob's ear, out to Jacob to the boys. Now watch verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet unto Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Notice the scepter. Who holds the scepter? The king does, doesn't it? Doesn't he? So who, where is the king going to come from? The tribe of Judah. You see, the scepter. The king is going to come out of. And Judah's descendants are going to be the ones where the seed line is going to travel through. But Judah's a big, come over to Psalms 132. Judah's a, one of the largest tribes. It, it is the largest tribe. It's not one of them. It is the largest tribe. So now what's going to happen? we got to narrow this thing down because Judah is going to be, the seed line is going to run through Judah, but now we got this big, all these families, all these people, so now where? Well, the Lord says, that's no problem. There's a young man over there in the house of Jesse by the name of David, and he's a man after my own heart, and I picked David. How about you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, Saul, Saul, King Saul didn't like that, <laughs> but... David is still picked, isn't he? Now watch Psalms 132, verse number 10. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set, set upon thy throne. Notice that. The fruit of the what? The body, the seed, the descendant. Verse 12, if thy children will keep my covenant, my testimony, that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forever. For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath des desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Now, notice something here. God has desired to dwell in the land of Zion. That's where the kingdom's going to be set up. That's that land promised to Abraham back there in Genesis 12. Okay, in 13, he's going to dwell there and he's going to sit some flesh on the throne. And there, that flesh is going to come from the lineage of David. Now, look at verse 12. Because isn't there a problem with David and his flesh? It's called sin, isn't it? Now, notice something. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forever. There's a problem. Because not all of David's lineage keeps the commandment. See? And now we begin to have some problems. And we begin to have a, 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 an issue that's going to come in now in David's lineage. Come over to Jeremiah chapter 22. They are sinners. And David's lineage begins to cause problems. You ought to take some time, the book of Kings and Samuel and Chronicles, and lay out the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. <laughs> and uh, that would be good Bible study. It'll keep you from fighting with your spouse for a while. Because your nose will be in the book trying to figure that stuff out and where they sit and where they go. And you know what begins to happen? You begin really to, real quickly to see that the kings of Israel are bad guys. And, and nine out of ten of them are. By the way, there's more than ten. But nine out of, you know, only one or two every now and then of Israel show up. But Judah seems to run true, but not always as the time goes by. Jeremiah 22 
You have, in, down in verse number 24, if you will, you've got, a, you've got a problem that pops up. As I liveth, saith the Lord, though Kona, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the, uh, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck the fence. You see that Kona guy? Remember last week I told you about Jeconiah back there in Matthew 1? Same guy. He's Kona here. Now watch now. Verse 28. In this man Kona. Now Kona, he's the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. He's the next guy in line to sit on the throne. But there's a problem with this guy. He, he's a bad guy. Okay? And the Lord in verse 28 says, Is this man, Kona, a despised, broken idol? Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? And the answer to all that is yes, by the way. Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not? O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days. For no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Isn't that interesting? What did the Lord just do to him? He, he called him what? Childless. Right there. So you've got Abraham, goes to Isaac, goes to Jacob. Jacob goes to Judah, the seed of the woman. Okay, do I need to put it on the board? Follow it in your mind. And the seed of the woman goes to David, and the seed then goes to Solomon. And then the seed goes over there to, to Jeconiah, because Jeconiah is one of the boys of Solomon. But what happened to the seed line? No more. It's childless. You see that? It's interesting. Keep that in the back of your mind. Come to Matthew 1 now. Where we were, where I showed you this. See, I gave you some hints last week, but I didn't proffer any of this. So in Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat, and, and then you just begin. You see, okay? You got Boaz there in verse 5. Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, verse 6, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of Hur, that's talking about Bathsheba, that had been the wife of Urias. So now we're going to run Solomon's line here, because the kings are David and Solomon. And you'll notice that what we do now, verse 7, and Solomon begat Robin, and off you go. You see that? And you get down there in verse 12 to Jeconias, how he begat Selethel and Sele Obviously, Jeconias had kids, didn't he? But the kids were what? Not going to sit on that throne. What did the Lord deem them? You ain't going to sit there. See that? By the way, do you know where Bethlehem comes from and the fact that the Lord is, has to be, be born in Bethlehem? Ruth chapter number 4 and Malachi ch or Micah chapter number 5. Ruth is over in Bethlehem. When her and Boaz get together, see, Bethlehem becomes a key component. Micah 5 is where Bethlehem is said to be uh, the small, but it's going to be the great. Now, I can't think of the verse right, so Micah 5 verse 2, give you the reference right. Ruth 4 verse 11 is the other one. Behold thou Bethlehem Ephetah, thou, thou though be little among a thousand of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth has been from old, from everlasting. That's how you know he's born in Bethlehem. But you see Jeconias. Now back in Jeremiah, he's called Kona. And in Matthew 1, he's called Jeconias. You see that J-E, that prefix? That's Jehovah. He's no longer connected to who? To Jehovah. He's been removed. So we have a problem here, don't we? Because you're in Matthew 1, I hope. Go back to Matthew 1. We have a problem. Because this genealogy ends with Joseph being the husband of Mary. 
So the genealogy in Matthew 1 shows the seed of the woman coming through Abraham, coming to Isaac, coming to Jacob, coming to Judah, coming to David, coming to Solomon, but running into an issue with Jeconias. So we have a problem, don't we? we ha- there's an issue here. Well, come over to Luke chapter number 3. Because we have another player involved, and that's Mary and the genealogy of Mary. <clears throat> the lineage got so bad that, you know what God did with Solomon's line? He ended the rights to the throne. So Joseph, even though Matthew is depicting the Lord as the king, and here's the royal connection, unless you understood Jeremiah 22, by the way, in First Chronicles and stuff, you would have understood that there was a denial to the line through Solomon. By the way, when Solomon died, do you know who he looked like? He looked like the Antichrist. He had gone after women, of outlandish women, women outside the land. He had a throne, a a, a white throne, a great white throne, and it had six, six, and six. It had six lions, six stairs, and six lions. Six, six, six. He, he completely mirrored the Antichrist and looked like it. That's not good. That's Solomon. Look, Luke 3. We're not talking about Solomon. We'll talk about Mary. Look th- Luke 3, verse 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli, which was the son of Matthew. And, and down we go all the way to Mary. Now, you'll see, you'll see the son of Heli. Heli is Mary's dad. Okay? Now, again, who's important in the family in Israel? It's the male, isn't it? See that? So, what does he mean here then by the son of? By the way, it's gonna, this, this genealogy starts and goes backwards. It starts at Jesus and goes all the way to Adam, which was the Son of God, verse 38. But do you see the, the son of Hela? Now in Matthew 1, it was Isaac begat Jacob, begatting. So there's a difference. A begat and a son are different. It, by the way, it's not a contradiction. A lot of times people use this to see, look, there's a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. Begat, begatting someone is to give life to. I begat Ricky. I gave life to Ricky. I gave life to Danielle and Emily. Okay? I am the son-in-law to Robert, Linda's dad. See? See? That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about son-in-law. Now, I'm, let me show you that so you see that. Hold on to here. Run back to 1 Samuel in chapter 24. Because I, I want you to see this. You guys with me so far? You see what's going on here? Okay. we got a problem in David's line. First Samuel 24. And look at verse 16. <coughs> By the way, Joseph's biological daddy was Jacob, ultimately, when you run it back up. He begat him, begat, begat, begat. But look at 1 Samuel 24, 16. And it came to pass when David was made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Now, is David, was Saul David's biological dad? No, he wasn't. Jesse was. So then why does he call him my son David? Well, David is married to one of Saul's daughters. And he's a son by law of marriage. So when you look here in Luke 3, the the son of is important because we're not talking about the biological fathers, we're talking through what? Marriage and the, the son of. So the genealogy of Mary, who by the way is married to who? Joseph, who is the son-in-law of Hela, who's Mary's dad. Okay? Follow that? 
Got you confused, don't I? Go back to Luke 1, or Luke 3. So, <clears throat> Joseph and Mary obviously are legally married. <laughs> so, drop down, if you will. I mean, you can read down through all those names and for sake of butchering and for time. We're not going to do that. If you look at verse 31... Well, look at verse 32. Which was the son of Jesse, which was the son of Obed, which was the son of Boaz. We're talking about David at the end of verse 31. Which was the son of David, which was the son of Joaz, which was the son of Obed, which was the son of Boaz, which was the son of, of Solomon, which was the... You see that? This, okay? You see David and Nathan? Now, Nathan is Bathsheba's second son when you go research it back. Okay, so the line to Mar for Mary works through who? Nathan, who is the son of David. Okay, through who? Through Bathsheba. It's interesting in Matthew 1, Bathsheba is one of the five ladies in the genealogy of the Lord. Because she's the mother of Solomon. But she's also the mother of Nathan. Say, here. So when we talk here about the seed line, here the seed line is going where? The seed of the woman going to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Judah, to David, through Nathan, to Helah, Mary. Follow all that? Okay. So through Nathan, we get to Mary, who is, by the way, the flesh of David, who Psalms 132 says the flesh of David is going to sit on the throne. So now Jesus Christ can sit on the throne through the flesh of David because Mary is married to Joseph, who has the legal rights, because he's the male, to the throne. But, okay, did I completely confuse you there? Okay, good. It's kind of one of those who's the first cousin, second cousin, third cousin thing, okay? But it's the, so the question then is, and this is where we get to who look at who saved Christmas, is how does Mary carry any rights in this whole, any of this discussion? Because the rights in Israel were passed through who? The male, except for a group of daughters. Go back to Numbers 27. <clears throat> Because how can Christ inherit the throne of David through Mary? Because Joseph isn't, Dave, isn't the Lord's biological daddy. See? Joseph and Mary are just married. There's a legal binding through marriage, but not through offspring. Yet who is the ultimate seed? The Lord is. How does he get there? It goes through Mary because what did the Lord Due to Jeconias, you're childless, you're done. <laughs> your, child, your seed will not sit on the throne. Even though he has seeds and it continues down to Joseph. So Joseph cannot be the biological dad of the Lord because then he couldn't sit on the throne. So then how, what gives Mary the right? And what gives the right to claim through Mary? And here's the group of ladies that save Christmas for you, if you will. Numbers 27 you, um, actually, we need uh, 26, uh, the, the end of, uh, bah, da, 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 where am I at? Numbers 27, okay? There's something that happens here in Numbers that when Moses begins to divide the inheritance out to Israel, that there's an issue that comes up, and it's going to play a vital role in this stuff that's going to work out with Mary. If you'll notice... Numbers 26 and verse 33, just to get some background. And now that name, Zilo Fahed, right? Okay, now it's going to sound, it sounds funny in my head, but Zilo Fahed, the son of Hefer, had no sons but daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zilo Fahed were, and there's five ladies listed there. You see the daughters of Zlo, Zlo, Zlofahed? He had no what? He had no sons. 
but yet he's, get, he's granted an inheritance. Chapter 27, verse 1. Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of, Macar, the son of Manasseh, the, the, of the families, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters, and he gives them there. Say, so th this guy is very important. He's of Joseph's line, of Manasseh. <laughs> he's not a nobody stuck over there. He, he's very important. And they're going to come now to Moses, because Moses is going to give out the, in he's dividing up the land, inheritance-wise, setting it forth in the law. And verse number three, our father died in the wilderness. And he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord and the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. Notice that. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family? Because he hath no sons. Boy, what a question. These ladies were on the ball because they know what's going to happen. Dad died, and because there's no males to carry the lineage on, we can get wiped out here. We can get erased. Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses, and Moses brought their cause before the Lord, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. Isn't that interesting? There sits a just God, doesn't he? And he says, you know what? They make a good case. There's no reason to wipe out a man's lineage just because he had no boys. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. Isn't that interesting? So ladies, guess what happened? You're now in play, and you're now very important, the daughters. By the way, if he has no daughter, then there's mechanisms there to give it to the kinsmen. Chapter 36 of, of Numbers, Numbers 36. By the way, when Moses says that, it's now what? It's now law, 36.2. And they said, The Lord commanded my Lord to give the land for an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by the Lord to give an inheritance of Zelophehad, our brother, unto his daughters. That's interesting. It's law now. Guess who's coming their way? Well, there's some stipulations, verse 3. Verse 3, And if they marry to any of the sons of other tribes of the children of Israel, then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and shall uh, be put to the inheritance of the tribe wherein they are received. So shall it be taken from the lot of our inheritance. And, and off you go, you get all the details. In other words, if they get married, guess what? They come with a dowry now. <laughs> they come with a, with, a, with a bank account, if you will. And that bank account is to move to, to the to the husband and get in the right order and the pecking order. The, the daughters, it, there, there's some, well, look over at verse 8. And every daughter that possesseth an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be wife unto one of the family of the tribe of her father that, he, that the children of Israel may enjoy every man the inheritance of his father. Neither shall the inheritance Remove from one tribe to another, but every one of the tribes of the children of Israel shall keep himself to his own inheritance. The land, by the way, that's what they're inheriting is the land. You know what it's to go to? It's to go to the daughters. Now, I want to read you something here about these, this situation. In the orders for the division of the land just given, no provision had been made for females. In case of failure of a, a in, in case of failure of male issue, the five daughters of Zelophehad therefore considered themselves as destitute, having neither father nor brother, and being themselves entirely overlooked. And they agreed to refer the case to Moses and the rulers, whether it were not equable, um, equitable that they should inherit their father's portion. This led to the enactment of an additional law to the civil code of Israel which satisfactorily ascertained and applied 
and 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 amp uh, and apply secured the right of succession in cases of inheritance. This law, which is as reasonable as it is just, stands thus, and there are five points to it. The father with no sons, if there's no sons, the daughters succeed. If there be no daughters, the brothers get it. And if there's no brothers or uncles, then the, the estate go to great uncles and grand uncles and grand, I mean, it just mixes it all up. But who started this issue were these ladies right here. When the Lord looked at the ladies, because Moses brings the case, what the Lord sees is their faith and what's going on in the, in the land of Israel. So there's a loophole created. So the seed line, now let's think about the seed line here. The seed line was designed to die under Jeconias, wasn't it? In Joseph's lineage, Matthew 1. But Mary is of the seed of David through who? Through Nathan. Because of the daughters of Zelophehad here, and because they were believing what God was doing in Israel and the value of the land, they set a precedent, of the, a precedent here for the inheritance to go through the daughters. This allows the loophole for Mary becoming the seed of the woman, becoming the seed, and not Joseph. Because Joseph's seed line says what? Nobody, you, none of your seed's going to sit there. So Joseph can't be the dad of the Lord because he's been condemned to be childless on the throne. So Mary's line, Mary gets it, because of these ladies right here, the daughters of Zelophehad. So look who saved Christmas. The daughters did. The ladies did. The, the ladies, they come along. And they look and they say, wait a minute, this is unequitable here. But not because we're women and hear me roar but because we understand that there's an inheritance in what God's doing in the land with Israel. And how is it right that we be excluded from that same purpose and plan? Our dad died in the wilderness not having followed the heathen element in Israel. That's Korah. The gainsaying of Kor and Korah and those guys and going after the pagan. He died in his sin, but he died as a believer in what God was doing in the nation of Israel. How can we... So you see, they didn't come with an agenda of we're women, hear us roar, rah, rah, rah. They came as believers saying, look, we understand. And you know what? God, he recognized their faithfulness. How did Mary come? We looked last week. How did she come? There in Luke 1. Consider the lowest state of thy handmaiden, remember? <laughs> she didn't come as, Rawr, here, here I am. She came as who? As a meek and mild handmaiden of the Lord. Understanding what's going on in Israel's position. And the loophole gets enacted so that Mary can be the virgin birth. So the daughters of Zelophehad are who saved Christmas for you. But they didn't save it just because they had to get their way. They saved it because they believed what's going, what God was doing in the nation of Israel. Now come over with me to, well, you get the point, okay? I sent an email out. Most of you got that about just reminding you of everything. And I said it last time, without Christmas, we wouldn't have had the cross, it was said. And that's very important that you understand that. He came, born of a virgin, not born on December 25th. The great thing is of December 25th is the conception, not his birth. We looked at that. By the way, on our YouTube page, the highest viewed video is the dating of the birth of Christ back in 2013. It's got over 3,000 views. Okay? That's interesting. Because what does that show? 
It shows that late December wasn't his birth, it's the conception. And but, but again, what is the prince, the power of the air doing? Let's hide it and let's make it about his birth. Unless he says, I, I came into the world to save sinners. I didn't come to condemn the world, I came to save it. He's the savior of all men, especially them that believe. And see, that's what we have to remember. And I know we do, and I know we think about that all the time. But don't forget these ladies, because they're very important. Because had they not created the loophole, then Mary would have been a little bit tough to prove Mary was okay. Because the the seed line always went through who? The male. But with Joseph, he couldn't because of Jeconias. So he had to have Mary's claim to the inheritance be there through Nathan. And it purifies and it keeps everything clean and right. So if someone says, well, who saved Christmas? Now you've got a little group of ladies in, back in numbers. Okay? So as we go today and we finish the morning out with whatever activities you do, just remember this. Remember what's going on. And I mean, I, I know you can get caught up in stuff. We all can. But just remember when the Apostle Paul says he, that according to my gospel, he was born of the seed of David. Remember Paul. Paul plays a very important role in this as well. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for everything that you've given to us through your Son, Thank you for everything that that you provided to us because of Calvary. But Calvary needed you to be born and come and walk among men and become our kinsman redeemer. And we thank you for that. We thank you for in everything that we say and do. We bring honor and glory to your name and to who we are in your Son. In your name we pray.